Nobody knows exactly why, but for a long time, the Vikings would take their most valuable belongings to wetlands. We're talking about cattle that they had raised since childhood, jewelry passed down to them from their parents, or a sort they had fought with in a land far from home. They would take them deep into the bogs and leave them there, forever parting with their valuables. Over time, these visitations and ritual gifts would become an infrequent affair. Eventually, like the other peoples of the world, they too would take no notice of these ancient places. By the industrial era, wetlands were no longer magical and mysterious, now they were seen as only useless and ugly places, more economically beneficial if drained and turned into farms. And all the folk tales that remained in our fairy tales, films and other fictions often portray swamps, bogs and other wetlands as dark and ugly places home to monsters and all things grotesque, ghastly and grisly to humans. But in reality, these vibrant places teeming with life are one of humanity's oldest and most vital protectors. They weren't homes, but prisons to the real monsters that threatened human lives. When we stopped seeing the beauty in wetlands and destroyed them to make way for our houses, farms and even parks, unwittingly, we unleashed the real monsters. It may seem contradictory, but in order to stay safe from floods, it's necessary to have wetlands. When it rains, the wetland earth soaks up all the water with its tall vegetation and deep roots and stores it in its massive reservoir. But developments in farmlands need water drained from them. Too much water can damage tools and kill crops. But when water is drained from the earth into nearby rivers and streams, it can quickly turn into a devastating flood. But what if it doesn't rain? What if it doesn't rain for a stupidly long amount of time and your wells go dry? It sure would have been good to have kept that natural reservoir of water, no? And now that the thirsty forest has burst into flame for getting too dry, without the wetland being where it used to be, it can no longer act as a fire barrier. The fire quickly spreads. Wetlands naturally purify the water so that life can thrive. They can remove up to 60% of metals and eliminate up to 90% of the nitrogen in the water. Now that they are mostly replaced with farms, instead of filtering the water, more industrial waste products are drained into our ravines and drinking water. Before the Industrial Revolution, the atmosphere had 30% less CO2 than today. Most of this CO2 was pumped into the sky by burning fossil fuels. But about a third of this emission is actually removed from the atmosphere by Earth's oceans and vegetations. I'm sure you're already familiar with the concept of forests being key in lowering CO2 emissions. But did you know that as carbon sinks, they're only a fraction as effective as wetlands? That's because when plants die and decompose, they release the carbon they captured back into the atmosphere. But when plants die in wetlands, they decompose very gradually and their carbon is trapped in water and under the moss. Peatlands, which are a kind of wetlands, cover only 3% of the Earth's land surface. But they account for keeping more than a third of its carbon stock. 30% of the planet is covered in forests, and yet they barely capture half as much carbon as peatlands. Wetland destruction is responsible for 5% of the annual human-induced CO2 emissions. This is more CO2 than what the entire aviation industry outputs. Over the last 300 years, a staggering 87% of the world's wetlands have been lost. During the 1960s, amidst years of natural habitat destruction, several nature conservationists came together to find a way to protect these places and the wildlife that dwelt within them. Iskandar Firuz, the Iranian Minister of Natural Resources who was a staunch environmentalist, offered the coastal resort of Ramsar on the Caspian Sea as a place to host this convention. And so on the 2nd of February 1971, and 100 kilometers away from my hometown, the Ramsar Treaty became the first global conservation treaty, which obligated the signatories to delegate at least one wetland site within their territories. This wetland would be known as a Ramsar site, which should be preserved. Fast forward to today. Wetlands are disappearing three times faster than forests. We don't appreciate wetlands and their ecosystems, which explains why they have been severely overexploited, turned into parks and developments, and wiped out by drainage. In Iran, the country that hosted the Ramsar Convention, 60% of the wetlands dried up, and all the remaining ones, including those assigned as Ramsar sites, are either in critical condition or slowly being dried up. After the Iranian Revolution, Eskandar, who is often referred to as Iran's father of environmental protection, was also sentenced to be hung by the neck. 
Exiled, he died years later in 2020. Wetlands host 40% of the world's biodiversity. That's right, 40% of all different species that we have discovered so far call these places home. The wetlands near my hometown attracted birds like flamingos, ducks and coots. Now they rarely show up. And they show up dead when they do. In 2014, when I first moved to London and was curious to explore it, the first thing I did was go on Google Maps and uh, look at the satellite view. The first thing I came across was this odd shape on the map, which at first glance seemed to me to be a switch treatment, but to my surprise it turned out to be a wetland, right in the middle of London, only 6 kilometers away from Buckingham Palace. I mean, what the hell was it doing here? Peter Scott was the son of an Antarctic explorer, and like his father, he too was keen on the wonders of the natural world. He had a special love for birds and wildfowl, and in 1946, he set up an organization to protect these birds and their habitats. It's thanks to him, but more importantly, thanks to the everyday people who volunteered to continue that legacy, that today we have places like this, even right in the middle of London. And you know it's people like this who give me hope that we could take better care and rejuvenate our wetlands. Perhaps in the dark days ahead, there is still a chance to escape from needless misery and destruction. When I was a boy, one of my favorite things to do in life was going to the bog that was behind our house with my aunt and uncles. Most of the time we went fishing, but sometimes we just went there to admire the lilies that were coming to bloom or catch the most colorful dragonflies. For me, the most important thing was the memories I shared with them. At least here in London, I can go to Barnes and reminisce on those old memories. 